Hi, my name is Kieran. Today I'm going to teach you about the physics of vibraphones. The vibraphone, or vibraharp as it was called when it was first invented, is a mallet instrument similar to the xylophone or the marimba. The vibraphone was invented in 1921 as a way of enhancing the mellow tones of vaudeville orchestras, but quickly it became a staple of jazz music. By the 1930s, vibraphone players were gaining high regard in the jazz world. Today, vibraphonists such as Gary Burton, Joe Locke, and St. Olaf's very own Dave Hagedorn are well-renowned musicians in the jazz world. The bars of a vibraphone are different from those of a marimba or xylophone in that they are made of a metal instead of wood, most often aluminum. The bars are coated with a smooth silver or gold finish. This layer is entirely cosmetic and has a negligible effect on the sound produced by a vibraphone. In a conventional vibraphone, each bar is suspended by two strings which pass through the bar's nodal points. I was able to set up an apparatus such that a single vibraphone key could vibrate freely apart from others. The bar's nodal points are the points at which the bar vibrates in its fundamental vibrational mode with minimum amplitude. This fact becomes apparent when a bar is covered with a light particle such as salt and is struck repeatedly. The particles will settle into the location of minimum amplitude. These points are located approximately 22.4% from each end of the bar. I was able to capture the vibration of the bar in high speed. Here you can see how the bar vibrates up and down in its fundamental mode at 554 Hz. I've listed at what frame rate I shot these videos in the lower left corner of the screen. Vibraphone bars conventionally have their first three harmonics tuned. This vibraphone has been tuned such that the middle A has a frequency of 442 Hz. We would expect the second harmonic of that note to have a frequency of 1768 Hz, two octaves above the fundamental, and the third harmonic to have a frequency of 4455 Hz, three octaves and a major third above the fundamental. Interestingly, when the note is first played, the amplitude of the second harmonic and third harmonic are far greater than the amplitude of the fundamental. Very quickly, these upper harmonics damp out and we are left with our fundamental pitch. Using lab view, I measured the actual frequencies of the bar with a supposed fundamental frequency of 221 Hz. Each of my measurements was in the margin of error of the theoretical value, which is to be expected considering that the vibraphone I was using is new and well maintained, so its harmonics have not gone out of tune significantly. Using Audacity, I was also able to determine the Q value of several vibraphone keys and determine how bar frequency related to Q value. For each key, the amplitude decays like E to the minus B over 2M times T, or E to the minus T over tau where tau is the time it takes for the amplitude to drop about a third of its initial value. I measured the amplitude of decay of each bar and plotted the log of that amplitude versus time. Initially, the amplitude is larger because of the very present second harmonic, but after the second harmonic has died down, the decay time is solely that of the fundamental. The slope of this line is related to the Q value of the bar with the equation Q equals pi times frequency over slope. I used a linear least squares regression fit to determine the slope. I found the Q value of the upper, middle, and lower A's on the vibraphone, and my results are listed in this table. It is clear that high frequency notes have higher Q values. This makes sense if you consider that the Q factor is not only a measurement of how quickly the amplitude of a signal decays in time, but also a proxy for the energy dissipated in each cycle due to damping by the system. The ideal vibraphone will have the same sustain length for high frequency and low frequency bars, so that when high and low frequencies are struck simultaneously, all notes will decay in volume at the same rate. However, higher frequency notes are oscillating through many more cycles each second than low frequency notes. Therefore, high frequency notes must be designed such that the energy they lose to damping each cycle is far less than the energy lost per cycle by low frequency bars. 
since the energy dissipated per cycle is inversely proportional to frequency, this explains why the Q factor of high frequency bars is much larger than that of low frequency bars. Listen to this chord, which is a mixture of high and low frequency bars played at the same time. Hear how the chord doesn't change as it decays? This is the Q factor at work. Vibraphones are also equipped with a set of aluminum resonating tubes. These tubes are used to amplify the fundamental tone of their associated bar. These tubes are designed to have a length such that the vibrating air beneath the bar travels down the resonator, is reflected off the closed end, then returns to the top and is reflected back by the bar, over and over, creating a much stronger standing wave and increasing the amplitude of the fundamental frequency. Each tube has a diameter slightly larger than its associated bar's width. The A442 tube has a length of 17 centimeters and a radius of 2.5 centimeters. Each tube is designed such that it captures as much of the sound wave of its associated bar as possible without capturing any sound from adjacent bars. One might expect that the dimensions of each tube are chosen such that the tube and the bar are in resonance with one another, each having the same fundamental frequency. However, when we measure the theoretical resonance of each tube using the relationship Frequency equals C over 4L, where C is the speed of sound in air, and L is the length of the tube. Comparing this with the frequency of its associated bar, we see that in fact, the tubes are designed to resonate at a frequency slightly higher than that of their associated bar. Why is this? The resonators of a vibraphone naturally increase the volume of the instrument while decreasing the sustain of each bar. In more technical terms, the resonators boost the amplitude of the sound produced by the bar, while reducing its Q factor and increasing the effective damping of the system. This damping is a result of the sound waves bouncing off of the bottom of the resonating tube and reaching the bar out of phase with the oscillations of the bar. These incoming out of phase sound waves sometimes damp the original oscillations of the bar and sometimes amplify them. By tuning the resonator tubes to be slightly higher than the fundamental frequency of their associated bar, Amplitude is still somewhat increased while the damping caused by out-of-phase waves is made less dramatic. I hope that this video taught you a little more about the vibraphone and the physics of acoustical waves and tubular cavities. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.